Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Vitale and today's topic of discussion is doubly fed induction motors. Our objective is to examine doubly fed induction motors. We'll examine several different operational modes and how by varying rotor excitation frequency one can control the resultant rotational speed of doubly fed induction motors. Just when you thought you'd seen the last of wound rotor induction motors, along comes the doubly fed induction motor which I know is just going to blow your freaking mind. If you've been following this lecture series in intended sequence, you recall we already examined squirrel cage induction motors and asynchronous generators, electrically excited synchronous motors and synchronous generators, and wound rotor induction motors in some detail. If we're to follow a predictable pattern, we should be driving straight into the generator aspect of wound rotor induction motors, but we're not. We're going to take an entertaining detour. Not only is this side trip entertaining, it's an important preamble to the upcoming doubly fed induction generator, since doubly fed induction generators are a natural extension of doubly fed induction motors. You'll no doubt recall wound rotor induction motors are very similar to squirrel cage induction motors, only the rotor, rather than being cast aluminum or copper cage-like structure, is composed of wire windings, hence the name. Additionally, wound rotor induction motors feature slip rings and brushes which allow access to the rotor. In the aforementioned wound rotor induction motor lecture, we explored how varying the resistance of the induction operated rotor can change the motor's operational characteristics under load. As cool as this is, it is not the only trick this animal can do. Given both the rotor and stator are accessible, there's a range of tricks wound rotor induction motors can do you've probably never thought of, each more insane than the next. We are already intimately familiar with the traditional induction mode of operation. In this mode, the rotor windings are connected together with or without external resistors, and three-phase AC is applied to the stator. In this mode of operation, induced current flows in the rotor windings, which creates its own magnetic field, which is attracted to the stator rotated magnetic field, and the rotor follows it around and around and around. Central to the induction mode of operation is quite obviously induction. This means the rotor must slightly lag the stator, even in the unloaded state. In induction mode, the rotor speed varies as a function of applied torque. Additionally, it's possible to change rotational direction by swapping any two phase sequences. But wait, that's not all. Given the stator and rotor windings are both accessible in wound rotor induction motors, what if we flip this concept on its head? Rather than supplying the stator with AC, we instead supply the rotor with AC. And rather than tying the rotor windings together, instead tie together the stator windings. Sure, go ahead, knock yourself out. This is still an induction motor and it behaves identically to the traditional induction configuration, albeit rotational directions reversed. For example, if we applied phase sequence 1, 2, 3 on the stator, initiated clockwise rotation, the same applied phase sequence 1, 2, 3 on the rotor would initiate counterclockwise rotation. More weirdness awaits. Think back to the principal difference between induction and synchronous motors. Induction motors operate via induction and exhibit variable speed as a function of load torque, whereas synchronous motors have a magnet on the rotor that locks into the stator at constant speed. Electrically excited synchronous motors get that magnet on the rotor by exciting the rotor field winding with DC electricity through a set of slip rings. In summary, a synchronous motor has AC on the stator and DC on the rotor. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I think so. Given both sets of windings are accessible in wound rotor induction motors, can't we excite the stator with AC and the rotor with DC and use it like a synchronous motor? Sure thing, this also works. When the rotor is excited with DC, it creates a fixed electromagnet on the rotor which locks into the stator. As with synchronous motors, wound rotor induction motors operated in synchronous mode exhibit constant speed inside their operational range, pull out torque roughly proportional to field excitation current magnitude, and the ability to control reactive power requirements based on field current magnitude. Additionally, wound rotor induction motors operated in synchronous mode necessitate the same starting circuits characteristic of synchronous motors due to the same complications we explored in the synchronous motor starters lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. Now before you run out and just grab an off the shelf DC power supply and hook it to the rotor, let me caution you this is not without its associated challenges. First, ensure the rotor windings you're making use of are rated for DC operation. Viewers will recall inductive impedance is a frequency dependent phenomenon where the inductive impedance magnitude Z sub L is equal to 2 pi FL. What's the frequency of DC? Zero. Zero hertz. This means these rotor windings will not present any inductive impedance to a DC source and given only the small resistive impedance, 
field current could reach unacceptably high values and damage the rotor windings. For this reason, it's imperative to manage field current magnitude by carefully monitoring DC exciter voltage and or placing some resistance in series with the rotor windings. The second challenge of applying DC voltage to a wound rotor induction motor rotor is the simple challenge of where to hook it. Oftentimes rotor windings are only accessible at one end and lacks access to the central node of a Y configuration. Think about it, a DC source has two connections, positive and negative, where the rotor has three, M1, M2, and M3. You might initially suspect you just grab any two rotor windings, but that would result in a wonky rotor magnetic field only two thirds of its intended strength. One way of getting around this connection challenge is by placing windings M1 and M2 in parallel with one another, and this parallel combination is in series with M3. Given the direction of conventional current travel and the polarity markers and windings M1 and M2, this creates a shared fixed north pole, and winding M3 creates a fixed south. It's still wonky, but not nearly as wonky as a two-thirds of a rotor electromagnet. While we're still in synchronous mode, what if we flip this concept on its head? Rather than supplying the stator with AC, we instead supply the rotor with AC, and rather than supplying the rotor with DC, we instead supply the stator with DC. This is also still a synchronous motor and it behaves identically to the traditional synchronous configuration, albeit rotational direction is reversed. For example, if applied phase sequence 1, 2, 3 on the stator initiated clockwise rotation, the same applied phase sequence 1, 2, 3 on the rotor would initiate counterclockwise rotation. So far we've discussed two induction modes, traditional AC on the stator and an induction rotor, and a flip-flopped alternate configuration with AC on the rotor and an induction stator, and two synchronous modes, traditional AC in the stator and DC in the rotor, and a flip-flopped alternate configuration with AC in the rotor and DC in the stator. Before we discuss the remaining mode, I'll let you in on a little secret. As comparable as the flip-flopped alternate configurations are to the traditional configurations, you're never going to run into them. And if you do, the only reason it's being used is for the same reason over 50 retired accountants put ape hangers and loud pipes on motorcycles i.e. they're attention-seeking jerks. Don't be a jerk and use the traditional configuration. You'd think that'd be all there is to say, but more weirdness awaits. Given this lecture is entitled doubly fed induction motors, you'd think there'd be more to say about induction mode, but there is not. Because the super extended play bonus round I'm about to show you is really an extension of synchronous mode. Albeit for some weird reason, people incorrectly refer to it as induction. What I'm about to show you is not induction. This is yet another synchronous mode and perhaps the most useful of the different doubly fed induction motor configurations. The mode I speak of applies fixed frequency three phase AC to the stator and variable frequency three phase AC to the rotor using a power electronics device known as an AC to AC converter. We'll examine the power electronics devices central to the operation of an AC to AC converter, rectifiers and inverters in greater detail in later lectures However, as a summary of the process, an AC to AC converter accepts incoming three phase AC with fixed magnitude and fixed frequency, rectifies it to all DC, then inverts this incoming DC to variable three phase AC with user adjustable magnitude and frequency, meaning the AC to AC converter can subject the rotor to high voltage, high frequency AC, low voltage, low frequency AC, or any other combination of voltage, magnitude, and frequency in between. As with the stator, three-phase AC on the rotor creates a rotating magnetic field. The two rotating magnetic fields lock into one another and the rotor is physically dragged along. Again, even though in practice this is called a doubly fed induction motor, I must again remind the viewer this is still synchronous operation. As a means of demonstrating my point, let's begin with slow motion analysis of regular synchronous operation, a fixed DC. With fixed zero hertz DC applied to the rotor, the physical position, symbolized by a circle, and the rotor electromagnet, symbolized by a red arrow, are one in the same. If the stator rotated magnetic field, symbolized by a white arrow, moves 90 degrees clockwise, the rotor is physically and electromagnetically dragged along 90 degrees clockwise as well. If the stator rotated magnetic field moves 180 degrees clockwise, the rotor is physically and electromagnetically dragged along 180 degrees as well. If the stator rotating magnetic field moves to 270 degrees, the rotor is physically and electromagnetically dragged along 270 degrees as well. 
Long story short, if the stator rotating magnetic field makes one full 360 degree revolutions clockwise, the rotor is similarly physically and electromagnetically dragged along for one full 360 degree clockwise revolution as well. If the stator does 12 turns, the rotor does 12 turns. Makes sense. Now instead of fixed DC, let's apply three phase AC to the rotor. In this scenario, the rotor's physical position and the electromagnet are not tied together anymore. There's two possible choices. The rotating magnetic field on the rotor can go in the same direction as the stator or opposite to it. Let's examine the same direction operation first. Consider the rotor and stator magnetic field separately and consider what happens if we apply regular fixed frequency AC to the stator and super slow three phase AC to the rotor such that the electromagnet on the rotor moves let's say 30 degrees clockwise at the same time it takes the stator to complete one full 360 degree revolution clockwise. Now let's look at what happens when these two electromagnets interact. Taken together, a quarter of the way through the cycle, the rotor and stator magnetic fields are still locked together, but the rotor physical position is a quarter of 30 degrees or seven and a half degrees behind. Halfway through the cycle, the rotor and stator magnetic fields are still locked together, but the rotor physical position is now 15 degrees behind. Three quarters of the way through the cycle, the rotor and stator magnetic fields are still locked together, but the rotor's physical position is 22.5 degrees behind. All the way through the cycle, both the rotor and stator magnetic fields made a full 360, but the rotor is physically 30 degrees behind, such that it completes only 330 degree turn every time the stator does a full 360. After two full turns of the stator, the rotor would be 60 degrees behind, three turns in the stator, 90 degrees, and so on. 12 full turns later on the stator, and the rotor only completes 11 turns in the same time period. See what happened? The rotor slowed down. Let's say this was still too fast. If we wanted to slow the rotor down even more, one could slightly increase the rotor excitation frequency such that the electromagnet is further displaced, let's say 60 degrees clockwise, in the same time it takes the stator to complete one full revolution. Taken together, a quarter of the way through the cycle, the rotor and stator magnetic fields are still locked together, but the rotor's physical position is a quarter of 60 or 15 degrees behind. Halfway through the cycle, the rotor and stator magnetic fields are still locked together, but the rotor physical position is now 30 degrees behind. Three quarters of the way through the cycle, the rotor and stator magnetic fields are still locked together, but the rotor's physical position is 45 degrees behind. All the way through the cycle, both the stator and rotor magnetic fields made a full 360, but the rotor's physical position is 60 degrees behind. In summary, for every full cycle on the stator, the rotor physically only moves 300 degrees. 12 full turns in the stator and the rotor would only complete 10 turns in the same direction. Again, the rotor slowed down. Given the rotor rotating magnetic field and the stator rotating magnetic field traveling in the same direction, in this case clockwise, one might draw the conclusion that the physical movement of the rotor is dependent on only the difference of the rotor rotating magnetic field and the stator rotating magnetic field. Long story short, when fixed frequency three phase AC is applied to the stator, and variable frequency three phase AC is applied to the rotor in the same rotational direction, the resultant rotor speed is dependent upon this formula, where the rotor speed is equal to 60 times the difference of the stator frequency and the rotor frequency divided by the number of pole pairs per phase. Consider regular synchronous operation where DC is considered to have an excitation frequency of zero hertz. Let's say we're using a two pole pair per phase motor with fixed frequency 60 hertz AC applied to the stator. Application of the doubly fed induction motor rotor speed formula demonstrates the rotor should move at 1800 RPM, exactly what we'd expect for traditional synchronous operation for a two pole pair per phase construction. What if we applied fixed frequency 60 Hz AC to the stator and super slow 1 Hz AC to the rotor in the same direction? Another application of the doubly fed induction motor rotor speed formula demonstrates the rotor should move at 1770 RPM. What if we kept 60 Hz AC applied to the stator and ramped up excitation frequency to the rotor in the same direction 1 Hz increments, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and so on? Successive applications of the doubly fed induction motor rotor speed formula demonstrates the rotor should move at 1740 RPM, 1710 RPM, 1680 RPM, and so on, decreasing in 30 RPM steps for every 1 Hz increase. If you think about it, given both magnetic fields are revolving in the same direction, the rotor is essentially responding to the resultant differential between them. 
and traditional synchronous operation with 60 hertz in the stator and pure zero hertz DC on the rotor, it operates like a two pole pair per phase synchronous motor at 60 hertz. With 60 hertz in the stator and one hertz in the rotor, it operates like a two pole pair per phase synchronous motor operated at 60 minus one or 59 hertz. With 60 hertz in the stator and two hertz in the rotor traveling in the same direction, it operates like a two pole pair per phase synchronous motor operated at 60 minus two or 58 hertz and so on. You might think of this in relative terms. Let's say a car traveling at 60 miles per hour passes a stationary car. Understandably, there's a 60 mile per hour differential. Now let's say the same car traveling at 60 miles per hour passes another car traveling the same direction at 10 miles per hour. Understandably, there would only be a 50 mile per hour differential between these two cars and so on. In summary, given fixed frequency AC on the stator, if we speed up the excitation frequency of the rotor in the same direction, the differential between the two rotating magnetic fields decreases and the rotor physically slows down. This is known as sub or hyposynchronous operation. As the prefixes sub or hypo are meant to imply, given both rotating magnetic fields traveling in the same direction, the resultant rotor speed is less than what it would ordinarily be than in traditional synchronous operation.